folk singer is dead after she was attacked by a pair of coyotes. What is the monkey doing? Tell me what's the monkey doing. He ripped her face off! We actually have a trainer in the water with one of our whales. If I show weakness, if I retreat, I may be hurt, I may be killed. Baby Azaria Chamberlain was taken by a dingo back in 1980. What up, what up, what up? Welcome everybody to Man Eaters, the only true crime podcast on the entire internet where all the killers are real animals. Whether it's bitings, scratchings, maulings, or clawings, my name is James and I'm here to talk about it. Thank you for joining us for what is another edition of one of my favorite little mini series that we do on the show. Of course, I'm talking about killer cryptids. Today, we are talking about one of the most famous, one of the most creepy, um, and one of the most well-observed cryptids in the world. I'm talking, of course, as the title of this podcast suggests, about the Jersey Devil. The Jersey Devil, definitely an A-tier cryptid for sure. Not up there in the S-tier with your with your Loch Ness monsters or your uh, your your Bigfoots or your Yetis, uh, but it is certainly an A-tier cryptid. I would say it's up there with potentially more famous or at least equally famous to the Mothman, of course, which we which we covered, and the Chupacabra probably is probably dwarfs it maybe by a little bit chupacabra is probably up there in the a team in the in the s tier I, i'm sorry now before we move on a little amusing podcast related anecdote i've actually recorded this about half this episode uh without realizing that there was a block of foam in my new microphone that was blocking the sound i was wondering why it was sounding so shit i was thinking i needed a refund Nope, it just turns out I'm dumb. I'm simple in the head. I'm deficient in many many a brain cell and um I don't check my equipment before we go. It just shows you uh how much I care about this show. That's a joke. I care a lot. I care a lot about you. How are you doing by the way? I feel like we haven't seen each other for like a bit. How's your mum? Oh. Prostate cancer. That's I mean, I, surprising oh that's surprising yeah yeah speaking of surprising you're gonna be surprised at uh some of the famous world historical figures that pop up in this story today but before we get to that uh, i really quickly just wanted to do a very very quick shout out a really quick thank you to the people who listened to last week's episode on yellowstone national park as i mentioned in that episode quite uh, a lot of research and time went into that episode uh so yeah to, to get such great feedback from people uh was really nice and thank you thank you very much for that also before we get to the story i uh, you know i've been thinking a lot about how i can emulate some of my favorite podcasts and what better way to emulate something than by to straight up steal one of their segments so that's what we're going to do today so i have a really great podcast that i used to listen to i don't listen to it much now because some of the hosts have changed and i don't like it as much but uh there was a podcast i listened to it's called twinovation and they'd open every episode with what they called the beef of the week it was basically an errance of grievances uh it was essentially an excuse for them to fight with each other uh but it was entertaining and i liked it and it was a way to get you know uh chaos off your chest and basically get rid of the bad vibes before you continue with an episode and i think that's a great idea i don't have a better title for it than beef of the week so at the moment we're just gonna straight up steal it and we're gonna call this the beef of the week uh and they did a little thing they, they would they would go it's the beef of the week moo i don't know if i'm ready to steal it that much but if you like it we'll do it okay so the beef of the week today I got food poisoning over over the New Year's break. Uh, I think I mentioned it last week as well. But I'm not. I'm I'm mad at KFC. It was KFC who did it. I'm I, d- I neglected to point a finger at who I thought the culprit was. But after you know a week or two of reflection, uh, I'm pretty damn confident it was a Zinger Burger I ate. So what bugs me though is how. I went through two days of very painful vomiting and and shitting, uh, almost nonstop, to the ire of my girlfriend, to the disdain of my pets, Uh, and it was a bad time for all. No one enjoyed themselves those couple of days, and I swore to myself I would never go back to one of those plays. I would never go back to that KFC ever again. So you tell me, how is it that their advertising is so pervasive that today all I could think about was going through the drive through and picking up one of their little like uh, uh, chicken tender sliders that they have here with the pepper mayo. I'm, I'm making myself moist in the mouth just thinking of it. 
how is that possible when I know the last time I went there, I ended up on the toilet bowl for two and a half days? What's going... That's my beef of the week. My beef of the week is with the chicken of the week. Uh, I, I'm just... I'm mad at how successful their advertising is. And if I was that successful with my advertising, I'd have more than two Patreon patrons. And I have... I, I don't know what else. I'd have, a car. A nice car. And a bike. I actually just bought a bike. But I'd have some nicer things. So I guess my beef of the week is with KFC... I don't know. You tell me what your beef of the week is. Email me at, at, at manitispodcast at gmail.com or where, whatever the fucking email address is. You'll, you'll, you'll find it. Anyway, that's the beef of the week done. Let's jump into the main story today. Now, a couple of sources, of course. Um, one of my favorite other podcasts, the last podcast on the, le- past, podcast on the left, um, they they talked significantly about the Jersey Devil a while back, a couple of years ago. Uh, a really good episode. A lot of information uh, I am reading today was found from there, as well as a cool little documentary that you can listen to on YouTube. It's called Mother Leeds's 13th Child. And the name might sound a little bit obscure to you, but if you hang in there and listen to the story, it's going to become very clear why it's called that very, very soon. So let's talk about the Jersey Devil. The Jersey Devil often referred to as the Leeds Devil, is a fabled beast supposed to live in the Pine Barrens woodland in South Jersey, according to the local traditions in both South Jersey and Philadelphia. Now, although there are numerous varieties, the creature is frequently characterized as a flying biped with hooves, or a bipedal kangaroo or weirven-like monster with a horse or goat-like head, leathery bat-like wings, horns, little arms with clawed hands, cloven hooved legs, and a forked tail. That's the typical description. Ha, huh, sounds like Scott Morrison had a baby. Ha <laughs> ha, boom. Political. It is frequently characterized as moving quite fast and making a high-pitched blood-curdling scream. Now, the legend has it that a Mrs. Leeds presumably Jane Leeds, also known as Mother Leeds. Well, she was a Pine Barrens local and she gave birth to the Jersey Devil. According to the folklore, Mother Leeds already had 12 children and upon learning that she was pregnant with her 13th, she cursed the fetus in annoyance, claiming that the child would be the devil. Now, Mother Leeds was giving birth to the child in 1735 on a stormy night with her friends and church friends surrounding her. The 13th child, who turned out to be just a regular kid, later revolved into a being with hooves, a goat's head, bat wings, and a forked tail. Before flying up the chimney into the trees, the youngster barked and yelled while beating everyone with his tail. According to other versions of the legend... The Jersey Devil killed its mother and killed and attacked many of the friends surrounding her. In other versions of the story, Mother Leeds was a witch and the child's biological father was the actual devil, Satan. According to some accounts of the story, local clerics later tried to drive the monster out of the Pine Barrens but were unsuccessful. Before the turn of the century, the Jersey Devil was known as the Leeds Devil, or the Devil of Leeds, perhaps in reference to the Leeds family who lived there, or the named southern New Jersey hamlet of Leeds Point. Some have suggested that Mother Leeds was really Deborah Leeds, since her husband, Yafet Leeds, mentioned 12 children in the will he created in 1736, which is, a, which is consistent with the mythology. In what is now Atlantic County, New Jersey, Deborah and Yafet Leeds also resided in the Leeds Point neighborhood, which is famously where the Jersey Devil legend takes place. The narrative of Mother Leeds, according to Brian Regal, a historian of science at Keene University, was not founded on a single actual figure, but rather on religious and political conflicts in colonial southern Jersey that became the topic of rumours and folklore among the locals. Regal claims that throughout time, folklore surrounding these historical disagreements changed and eventually gave rise to the contemporary, well-known mythology of the Jersey Devil in the 20th century. Regal argues that the Leeds family were called monsters as a result of colonial-era political intrigue involving early New Jersey politicians, including Benjamin Franklin and Franklin's rival almanac publisher, Daniel Leeds. 
Rather than an actual creature, Regal claims that Daniel Leeds' derogatory description as the Leeds Devil is what later gave rise to the legend of the Jersey Devil. Daniel Leeds' third wife had given had given birth to nine children, which even at the time was a lot of damn children, much like Mother Leeds of the Jersey Devil legend. Both Leeds' first daughter and second wife had perished in the delivery. Leeds had also surveyed and purchased land in the Egg Harbor region, which is located inside the Pine Barrens, as a royal surveyor with the significant ties to the British monarchy. Leeds Point, one of the Pine Barrens locations now most connected to the Jersey Devil mythology and reported sightings of the Jersey Devil, is the name given to the property that the Leeds' son and relatives acquired. The southern part of New Jersey, where the Pine Barrens exist, was settled by English Quakers beginning in the 17th century. After publishing astrological symbols and texts in his almanacs in 1687, famous southern New Jersey colonial figure and Quaker Daniel Leeds was shunned by his religious party. The astrology in these almanacs was thought to be excessively pagan or blasphemous by Leeds' fellow Quakers, and the almanacs were banned and burned by the local Quaker community. Leeds published even more esoteric astrological Christian publications in reaction to and in spite of this restriction, and he grew increasingly interested in Christian cosmology, demonology, angelology, and natural magic. Leeds continued to argue with the Quaker community in the 1690s after his writings and almanacs were further censored as blasphemous or heretical by the Philadelphia Quaker meeting. He converted to Anglicanism and published anti-Quaker tracts that attack Quaker theology and claim that Quakers were anti-monarchists. The much-despised British royal governor of New Jersey, Lord Cornbury, who was hated by the Quaker towns, supported Leeds in the subsequent fight over Leeds' claims with the Southern New Jersey Quakers. Around this period, Leeds also served as Lord Cornbury's counsellor. Leeds was later labelled as evil by the Quaker Burlington meeting in southern New Jersey for supporting the crown whilst rejecting Quaker principles. Titan Leeds, the son of Daniel Leeds, and that is a fucking kick-ass name, Titan. Titan Leeds took over his father's almanac company in 1716. This almanac continued to employ astrological information and eventually competed with Benjamin Franklin's well-known Poor Richard's Almanac. The rivalry between the two men grew in his satire In his satirical 1733 almanac, Benjamin Franklin predicted Titan Leeds' demise in October of the same year by using astrology. Titan Leeds evidently took offense to Franklin's forecast of his death, calling him a fool and a liar, despite the fact that Franklin's prognosis was meant as a practical joke on his rival and a way to increase almanac sales. In a reaction that was published, Franklin made fun of Titan Leeds' wrath and made the lighthearted claim that Titan Leeds had indeed passed away in line with the previous prognosis and was now producing his almanacs as a ghost, raised from the dead to stalk and taunt Franklin. It's really funny to imagine that uh, Benjamin Franklin is like bullying someone because he looks like the fucking biggest loser in the world if you look at like, I was going to say photos, if you look at pictures of him, he looks like what... I would look like at the time. Not, really shouldn't be bullying anyone. So even after Titan Leeds' actual death in 1738, Franklin continued to playfully refer to him as a ghost. At that point, uh, Ben, you need to just, you need to calm down. All right, he's dead. The local folk tale of a so-called Leeds devil lurking in the Pine Barrens may have originated from or contributed to Daniel Leeds' reputation as a blasphemer, an occultist, as well as his pro-monarchy stance in the largely anti-monarchist colonial south of New Jersey. Benjamin Franklin's later continuous depiction of Titan Leeds as a ghost may also have played a role. Titan Leeds started putting the Leeds family emblem on the masthead of his almanacs in 1728. The Wirven, a mythical animal with wings like a bat and clawed feet, was represented on the Leeds family crest. The Wirven, on the Leeds family crest, according to Regal, is evocative of popular descriptions of the Jersey Devil. The presence of this family crest on Leeds' almanac would have worsened the Leeds' family's bad image among locals and probably affected how the Leeds Devil, or Jersey Devil, was described. 
The legend of the Leeds Devil and the association of the Leeds family with devils and monsters may have made possible may have been made possible by the terrifying appearance of the family crest Swerven and the glowing and the growing hostility amongst South Jersey residents towards royalty, aristocracy, and nobility, with whom family crests were associated. Regal claims that the Jersey Devil had become a well-known mythical beast or ghost story in the southern New Jersey region by the late 1700s and the early 1800s at the latest. Stories of the Leeds Devil, a monster roving the Pine Barrens, persisted in southern New Jersey into the early to mid-19th century. Following that, the Pine Barrens region developed an oral tradition of the Leeds Devil monster-slash-ghost tales. The Jersey Devil image and moniker first became genuinely standardized in its current form around the early 20th century, according to Regal, even though the Leeds Devil mythology is said to have originated in the 18th century. Now, during the pre-revolutionary period, the Leeds family, who were called the Pine Barrens Hall, soured its relationship with the Quaker majority. The Quakers saw no hurry to give their former fellow religionists an easy time in circles of gossip. His wives had all died, as had several children. His son, Titan, stood accused by Benjamin Franklin of being a ghost. The family crest had winged dragons on it. In a time when thoughts of independence were being born, these issues made the Leeds family a political and religious monsters. From all of the, from, from all this time over, the legend of the Leeds Devil was born. References to the Jersey Devil do not appear on newspapers or any other printed material until the 12th century. The first major flap came in 1909. It is from these sightings that the popular image of the creature, that like wings, horse head, claws, and general air of a dragon, became standardized. In fact, before the term Jersey Devil became widely used, several allusions to a Leeds Devil or Devil of Leeds can be found in older printed materials. In 1859, the Atlantic Monthly published an article describing the folk tales about the Leeds Devil that Pine Barren locals were fond of. The Devil of Leeds was purportedly observed close to the Pine Barrens and was well known among the locals of Burlington County, New Jersey, according to reports in a newspaper from 1887. Yet whenever he went near it, it would give the most unearthly yell that frightened the dogs. It whipped at every dog on the place. That thing, said the colonel, is not a bird nor an animal, but is the Leeds Devil, according to the description. And it was born over in Evesham, Burlington County, a hundred years ago. There's no mistake about it. I never saw the horrible critter myself, but I can remember well when it was roaming around the Evesham woods 50 years ago, and when it was hunted by men and dogs and shot at by the best marksmen there was in all of South Jersey but could not be killed. There isn't a family in Burlington or any of the adjoining counties that does not know the Leeds Devil, and it was the bugaboo to frighten children when I was a boy. That was like every American accent blended into one. So yeah, I mean, I find that super duper interesting. The fact that Ben Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, founding father Benjamin Franklin, fucking Quaker Oats himself, may be the person who came up with this whole goddamn Jersey Devil thing. Is That's mind-blowing to me. But he's not the only person um, of fame and repute who will pop up in this story. So... We're going to talk now about some reported sightings of the Jersey Devil, and there are quite a few of them. So, there have been several reports of incidences and sightings of the Jersey Devil. According to folklore, Commodore Stephen Decatur saw a flying monster when visiting the Hanover Millworks to see how his cannonballs were being made. He then immediately fired a cannonball at it, but it had no impact. It is also said, and here's where it gets interesting, that Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's older brother and the king of Spain at that time saw the Jersey Devil while he was hunting in his border town home in 1820. So for some reason, Joseph Bonaparte was in America at the time, was in Jersey. He was hunting and he saw it, which I've heard people say, like, no, he was just hunting and he heard something and someone said it was the devil. But yeah, 
The Jersey Devil was held accountable for multiple cattle deaths that occurred around 1840. Similar assaults with tracks and cries were documented in 1841. That's quite similar to, if you remember, the Chupacabra story that we covered a while back. Very similar to that. A local farmer in Greenwich shot an unidentified animal in December of 1925 as it tried to steal his hens. Then he took photos of the dead animal. He later said that none of the 100 individuals he showed it to were able to recognize it. A reporter for the Pennsylvania Bulletin of July 28, 1937, connected an unidentified animal observed by locals of Downs- Downingtown, Pennsylvania, on July 27, 1937, to the Jersey Devil. A group of youths from Gibbstown, New Jersey, claimed to have seen a monster in 1951 and, in 1957, reports of a body that matched the Jersey Devil description surfaced. In 1960, sounds and tracks at May's Landing were allegedly made by the Jersey Devil. That same year, local business owners in Camden offered a $10,000 prize for information leading to the arrest of the Jersey Devil. They also stated they would construct a private zoo to hold the animal if it could be captured. Newspapers reported hundreds of purported New Jersey Devil sightings from all throughout South Jersey and the Philadelphia region during the week of January 16th through the 23rd, 1909. The monster allegedly attacked a trolley vehicle at Haddon Heights and a social club in Camden, among other reported encounters. Police allegedly shot at the animal in Camden and Bristol, Pennsylvania, but to no avail. Other sightings of animals like the Jersey Devil were soon recorded in South Jersey, as well as far away as Delaware and Western Maryland. The first accounts of these encounters involved unknown tracks in the snow. The Delaware Valley was gripped by a panic as a result of extensive media coverage, which led to a number of schools closing closing and employees staying at home. In the quest for the Jersey Devil, uh, vigilante squads and hunting packs prowled the woods and fields. The Philadelphia Zoo allegedly offered a $10,000 bounty for the animal uh, around this time. A number of frauds, including a kangaroo with fake claws and bat wings, were created in response to the offer. And I want to talk a little bit about that because in the documentary that I just watched, they talked a lot about this guy. So this dude, and I can't remember his name, he basically saw that there was a lot of interest in this Jersey Devil. So what he actually did was he started planting stories about the Jersey Devil in newspapers and almanacs in the area, basically giving descriptions of the animal and the reason he did this was because he was going to construct the animal later on and if he gave the description of what it would look like earlier he could basically mold the devil to be what he wanted it to look like so here's what he did and this blows my mind because this is ages ago this isn't recent history this guy went out of state i believe to new york or something like that and he actually bought a kangaroo from a friend or he borrowed a kangaroo from a friend i don't know why there was a guy with a kangaroo in new york but he apparently did. Apparently, the issue with fucking exotic animals in America is very long standing. But anyway, he got this kangaroo and he took it back and he painted it with green stripes across its body. Now, the kangaroo licked the green paint off and it almost fucking died because of it. Uh, so the guy painted it with a different kind of paint and the kangaroo left it be. All right. And then he constructed uh, some like uh, wings, leathery leathery kind of bat wings and the kangaroo destroyed them because he doesn't like having wings sticky taped to his back so he destroyed those and then the guy made like wings out of i think it was like bronze and rabbit fur to make it look more realistic and it was a lot lighter and the kangaroo dealt with that and to top it all off he put a little pair of antlers on its head and so what they would do was they it was called like a, a was it like a dime circus or a a penny circus, a dime circus, or a dime show, something like that. Basically, people would come and see it. They'd raise the curtain, and this fucking kangaroo painted green with fucking wings would just be sitting there. And it was a very dimly lit room, so that's why people didn't get up and leave straight away. Uh, But apparently, what what the problem was is that the... um, (laughs) <laughs> the the kangaroo didn't feel like performing some days. So what the guy would do was he would pay a little child to sit behind the stage or under the stage with a stick with a little nail attached to it and he would just poke he would just poke at the kangaroo to make it move. And that's basically like that is a really great use of a kangaroo. If anyone needs a kangaroo by the way, I live in Australia. I've got great access to kangaroos. Now, there are a couple of possible explanations for the Jersey Devil. Uh, what I just explained was a possible explanation for one uh, batch of, of possible sightings, but it doesn't explain all of them, and it doesn't explain the origin. So here's a, here's a possible explanation. Um, 
boogeyman tales made up and told by bored Pine Barrens residents as a form of children's entertainment, the byproduct of the historical local disdain for the Leeds family, the misidentification of known animals, and rumors based on common negative perceptions of the local rural population are all plausible natural explanations. Skeptics believe that the New Jersey Devil uh, to be nothing more than a creative manifestation upon the imaginations of early English settlers. Now that seems silly to us now, but you've got to think about like the mindset of these people who are just moving to America. America is a very new country at this point. And a lot of the animals in America, it's the same as the animals in Australia. They don't exist anywhere else on the planet. These people had no idea about these animals. So you're getting there and you're seeing weird, you're seeing, you know, massive grizzly bears and mountain lions and wolves and all these creatures that you might not have seen before. You're seeing, what are you seeing? You're seeing fucking beavers and shit like that. You know, another, another an example is the Native Americans. You know, they, they would tell these fantastic stories about how like, oh, if you travel more inland into, into the continent, you'll see, you know, hordes of millions of massive horned creatures. And of course that sounds fantastical, but what happened when the early American settlers did that, when they moved inland, what did they see? That an animal that we talked about last week, they saw, and at that time it was millions of them, they saw millions of massive bison, horned bison moving through, you know, the, the grasslands of America. So it's not crazy for them to think that an animal like this could exist. As far as they know, it, it did. Because, you know, and I'm not saying that they thought it was a, a supernatural phenomenon, but the, the further that these people moved inland in America, the more crazy, dangerous fucking animals they saw, rattlesnakes and shit, you know? So for them, for there to be a weird flying kangaroo-like creature, it was not outside the realm of possibility. The early Pine Barrens' eerie reputation may have influenced the mythology of the Jersey Devil. The Pine Barrens were formerly thought to be an inhabitable, uninhabitable territory. Highway gangs, including the Pine Robbers, a group of politically despised loyalist brigands, were well known for robbing and attacking people going through the Barrens. Poor farmers, fugitives, brigands, Native Americans, poachers, moonshiners, escaped slaves, and deserting soldiers were just a few of the undesirables that lived in the remote Pine Barrens throughout the 1700s and 1800s. To deter outsiders or intruders from approaching the Pine Barrens, so-called Pineys have occasionally spread some terrifying tales about themselves in the area. Following the publication of two eugenic studies in the early 20th century that painted Pineys as con <laughs> congenitally stupid and criminal, Pineys were further demonized and vilified. This is evident in Henry H. Goddard's study of the Callicuck family, which is now regarded as biased and inaccurate and most likely falsified. The Humane Society of New Jersey's Jeff Bronner believes that the Sand Hill Crane serves as the foundation for the Jersey Devil legends, but he also points out that there are no photographs, no bones, no hard evidence at all, and worst of all, there's no explanation of its origins that does not require belief in the supernatural. Tom Brown Jr., an author and outdoorsman, lived in the Pine Barrens for a number of seasons. He recalls incidents in which he smeared his entire body in mud to ward off insects, which caused horrifying hikers to mistake him for the Jersey Devil. The 1909 series of sightings and the ensuing public fear are all cited by medical sociologists uh, Robert E. Bartholomew and novelist Peter Hassel as a prime example of widespread hysteria sparked by a local urban legend. In order to find proof that the Jersey Devil does, does in fact exist, one New Jersey organization known as the Devil Hunters spends time gathering reports, touring historical locations, and going on nocturnal hunts in the Pine Barrens. They identify themselves as official researchers of the Jersey Devil. Aww, oh, that's so cute. They go camping together, guys. The Pine Barrens itself have given rise to numerous folk stories, in part because of their isolation and lack of development. In addition to the Jersey Devil, the Prime Barons are the subject of numerous other legends. Supernatural entities and, and ghosts purported to haunt the Pine Forest include the ghost of the pirate Captain Kidd, who is said to have hidden treasure there and occasionally has been seen with the Jersey Devil. 
the ghost of the Black Doctor, a kind-hearted spirit of African-American Doctor Who, after being prohibited uh, from doing so because of his race, entered the Pine Barrens. Folklore also surrounds the Blue Hole, a spherical, extremely clear body of water in the Pine Barrens between Winslow Township and Camden County and Monroe Township in Gloucester County that is sometimes linked to the Jersey Devil. Rutgers professor Angus Cress Gillespie claimed that the, throughout the most of the New Jersey Devil's history, the narrative was an obscure regional tradition, and that after more than 250 years in oral circulation, the legend of the Jersey Devil has several versions. As is evidence that the recent history of the Jersey Devil is more in the domain of popular culture than folklore. Gillespie cites the Devil's image appearing on t-shirts, buttons, and postcards, as well as drinks named after the Devil. Now, of course, when there is such a massive, you know, public outcry about a uh, supernatural figure, there are hoaxes that are going to happen, just like we mentioned before with the dude who painted the kangaroo green, and here's a few more of these hoaxes. So, the reported Jersey Devil footprints from 1909, according to Gordon Stein in the Encyclopedia of Hoaxes, looked like a horse's hoof. Stein claims that a man eventually acknowledged fabricating some of these footprints. According to Jeff Tibbles, the world's greatest hoaxes, Norman Jeffries was engaged in the Jersey Devil hoax. The Jersey Devil rumors were widely known to Norman Jeffries, a well-known hoaxer and publicist for the Philadelphia Art Street Museum. Thus, when T.F. Hopkins, the owner of the museum, acknowledged that it faced closure unless Jeffries came up with a way to increase attendance, the publicist concluded that a captive Jersey Devil would be the perfect crowd puller. This is the story I think uh, I was telling you before. Additionally, he fabricated news articles claiming fresh reports of the devil. In 1909, Jeffries and his animal trainer buddy, Jacob Hope, bought a kangaroo from a circus and attached fake claws and bat wings on it. The devil was on exhibit at the museum once they made their capture public knowledge. 20 years later after the prank, Jeffries acknowledged it. Folklorist Richard Dawson provides a six-point framework for differentiating uh, between American folklore legends being in men based in the American comic legend. Although Dawson doesn't specifically mention the Jersey Devil, it still qualifies for this degree of relevancy. According to Dawson, the qualification must be imaginative or mytholo mythological, exist in oral tradition, inspire belief and conviction, become personalized and institutionalized, and be endearing to the American people, and have a comical side. The Jersey Devil's oral history predates recorded newspaper articles by a significant margin, and many people still hold this notion today. Investigative series like Mother Leeds' 13th Child, In Search of Monsters, Lore and Monsters, and Mysteries in America, as well as commenters who expound on this notion, make the latter apparent. It serves as the moniker for two professional high school... The Jersey Devil serves as the moniker for two professional ice hockey clubs as well, making it a staple of organizations. The Eastern Hockey League's original team, the Jersey Devils, competed from 1964 until the league's dissolution in 1973. The National Hockey League's New Jersey Devils have been active since 1982. Shortly after the club moved to New Jersey, a vote was conducted to choose the name of the current team, which was originally known as the Colorado Rockies. The Jersey Devils appropriation into toy lines such as inclusion in vinyl figures in cryptozoic entertainment cryptkins blind boxes as well as by as well as its use as a motif by six flags great adventure for their jersey devil coaster developed by rocky mountain construction are further examples of this same trend towards cultural incorporation the jersey devil has popped up multiple times in popular culture including in the x-files episode the jersey devil the wolf among us 13th child teenage mutant ninja turtles the real adventures of johnny quest the barons carney a night with the jersey devil the last broadcast legend quest what we do in the shadow and gravity falls they are among some of the works of fantasy that the jersey devil has appeared in many of these like the teenage mutant ninja turtles and the jersey devil video game do more than just reflect the jersey devil as a matter of fact i actually watched the x-files episode the jersey devil i remember watching that when i was a kid uh and they they really take some liberties with it it's not a jersey devil like we've talked about it's more like a missing link kind of caveman or woman it's like a man raised in the wild by i don't know fucking beavers or something and he punches people and eats garbage uh so i don't i don't like that episode and after learning all about the jersey devil it would have been a lot cooler sorry my cat's just tearing some shit up birdie stop it 
would have been a lot cooler for them to just do it like the Jersey Devil is supposed to be done. But hey, that's just me. So guys, that is, that's the legend of the Jersey Devil. Really interesting stuff. I was shocked, honestly shocked when Napoleon's goddamn brother showed up and flabbergasted when fucking it turns out Benjamin Franklin might have just made up the whole thing by calling his friend an asshole. And not his friend, his rival, basically calling his asshole, his asshole rival a fucking ghost or some shit. Crazy, crazy days. We're going to take a break now, guys. We might hear some messages. We might not, but we'll be back soon with our Scratch of the Day. All right, sluts and fucks, we're back with the Scratch of the Day. For those of you who don't know, the Scratch of the Day is the segment of the show where we go into the news, we find animal attacks that have happened in the past few weeks, and we read the news articles. I have not read these. We read them live together. We experience this together, guys. Are you excited? I am excited as well. This uh, this uh, first article is from the New York Post. It says, uh, raised by wolves actress attacked by seal in wild video. Uh, so if there is a video, we will play that uh, video uh, f- uh, audio, and we will listen to that as well. Um, Okay, so yes, New York Post posted this originally. News.com.au has shared it. Uh, it's an entertainment story. Actress bitten six times by seal in front of horrified onlookers. I was attacked. Let's uh, let's play the audio first, and then we'll read the story. Oh. Oh wow. She's getting fucked up. Oh. Oh, it's like it's cute, it's little. Oh. <laughs> it's hanging on to her. Oh, wow. Yeet! She yeets it into the water. <laughs> and it swims back after her. Good. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> that was a good video. An actress from Raised by Wolves had to be hospitalized after getting mauled by an angry seal in South Africa. In a scene, she compared to something from the movie Jaws. The clip is currently making its waves online amid a spike in, uh, in pinniped attacks. I'm assuming pinniped, what does pinniped mean? Sorry, we have to stop reading the article because I need to know if that's another word for uh, for seal. Pinniped. Seals, okay, yeah, pinniped means seals, great. <clears throat> the bizarre encounter occurred Wednesday while the South African-born actress who was raised in Los Angeles was swimming in the oceans off Clifton Beach in Cape Town, Jam Press reported. Be careful swimming at Clifton. Oh, she's South African. I've got to do an accent. Be careful swimming at Clifton. I was attacked by a seal in the water. (laughs) That's bad. Victim Lulu Taylor, who plays Cassia in the HBO Max series, wrote in an Instagram story describing her real-life horror movie scene, Citizen reported. So she posts a photo on Instagram. Uh, It looks like two of her fingers were bitten, but she didn't lose anything. And uh, the... The status that she says, uh, or not the status, the, the caption that she says on the photo says, status update, I'm on the mend. Oh, it's, I've got to do the accent again. The status update, I'm on the mend. Recent surge in seal attacks is linked to an algae bloom which releases a neurotoxin which triggers aggressive behavior. What might cause the algae blooms? More likely global warming slash water pollution. Heartbreak emoji. The clip posted on social media, starts off innocently enough with the Cape fur seal pup wading into the water. The blubbery <laughs> brigand then makes a beeline for a young boy frolicking the waves as bystanders urge the youngster to get out of the water. Unfortunately, the meat torpedo... What is this author doing? The meat torpedo is on top of the youth in seconds and starts attacking him before bystanders drag the perturbed pinniped off and carry the boy to shore. But the seal's rampage is far from over. The sea, oh fuck you! The sea real 
Mauler swims out to deeper waters where Taylor is treading and begins savaging her as she screams in terror. The Flat Tires star tries to fight off the frenzied marine mammal, but to no avail, prompting eyewitnesses to rush in out of the ocean uh, to her rescue. She's finally dragged to safety when a man grabs the seal by the tail and tosses it back into the drink after everyone's out. This author has a thesaurus. He got a thesaurus for Christmas, I can tell. According to Taylor's Instagram story, she was bitten six times, requiring an ER visit and strong antibiotics. They have big teeth, claimed the actress, who later uploaded a fan picture of the iconic Jaws poster with the shark swapped out for a seal. Two people were treated for bite wounds following the savage attack. Thankfully, it appears that the thespian is recovering well. Taylor posted a status update later that Wednesday in which she said she was on the mend. Taylor attributed the South African recent spike in seal attacks to an algae bloom that releases a neurotoxin which triggers aggressive behaviours. What might cause the algae blooms, Taylor mused, more than likely global warming or water pollution. Indeed, wildlife experts postulate that the seal's rampage was due to a swelling of the brain caused by domic acid poisoning from a red tide algae bloom, the Daily Maverick reported. Any, uh, however, officials with the Hout Bay Seal Rescue Center claim that the animal was stressed out by the throngs of beachgoers surrounding it. Any predator that is surrounded and harassed like the seal would have, was would have reacted the same way. But of course, the video doesn't show the part where the seal is being stressed by a crowd of people surrounding it, the orgs marketer directed Dune Spence Ross told News24. Yesterday, the beach girls were lucky. It was only a yearling approximately 12 months old, weighing no more than 10 kilograms by the looks of it, she added. If that was a fully grown seal, the headlines would have been very different. Investigators into the attack are ongoing with Cape Town officials, noting that the similar incidents involving aggressive seals transpired in Noorhook and Fishhook in recent months, Jam Press reported. There you go. What an interesting story. I'm going to link to that in the in the caption of this podcast, wherever you're listening to it. You can read that. Quite interesting. Uh, yes. Yes, again, the guy who wrote this definitely had a thesaurus at the ready. Ben Coat. Ben Cost, I'm sorry, is the writer. Thank you for that, Ben. Okay, moving on to our next uh, article. Alaska State Trooper killed by a Muskosk attack uh, outside home. Tragically, uh, I'll just read the whole thing. Hold on. Um, so, yeah, Fox News reporting, um, which, I mean, Fox News, but whatever. Okay. Um, yes, Alaska State, state Trooper killed in Musk Ox attack outside his home. Tragic loss for our state. Court services offer Curtis Warland was fatally attacked after his, uh, sorry, after trying to keep a, gra- a group of musk oxen away from a dog kennel near his home. A state trooper in Alaska died Tuesday afternoon from a wild animal attack outside his home. The agency reported court service offer Curtis Warland was fatally attacked by a musk ox after trying to scare a group of them away from a dog kennel by his home, which was near the town of Nome. Warland, who was in his 13th year of service, was declared dead at the scene. Austin McDaniel, a spokesperson for the troopers, told the Associated Press he could not immediately report on how many musk oxen were in the group Warland was trying to keep away. McDaniel added that court services officials, uh, officers, a law enforcement office, officers who provide prisoner transport services, courthouse security, and court document services. In a news release, the agency said that Warland worked as CSO at the Nome Alaska State Trooper Post during his entire career, which began in December of 2009. Curtis Curtis proudly wore the court services officer uniform and honorably served the people of Alaska for 13 years. He was a proud member of the Nome community and a dedicated member of the Alaska Law Enforcement Enforcement Family, Alaska Department of Public Safety Commissioner James Cockerell said in a news release. I hope that Alaskans will keep Curtis's family, friends, loved ones, and the Alaska State Troopers in your thoughts as we prog- pr- uh, process this tragic loss for our state. He will be sorely missed by the DPS family. The Alaska State Troopers posted the following tribute to Walland on the agency's Facebook page on Tuesday evening. We are deeply saddened to report that... Oh, I'll do the accent. 
We are deeply saddened to report that one of our own, Court Service Officer Curtis Warland, was tragically killed by a musk ox attack near Nome early today. CSO Warland was attempting to haze a group of musk ox near his dog kennel from at his home when he was attacked and fatally injured by a musk ox. CSO Warland proudly wore the Court Service Officer uniform and honorably served the people of Alaska for 13 years. He was a proud member of the Nome community and a dedicated member of the Alaska law enforcement family, and he will sorely be missed. Um, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game said musk ox and a stocky, long-haired animals with slight shoulder humps and horns. They can weigh up to 800 pounds, which is 363 kilograms. That is a lot. The Alaska State Troopers, Alaska Wildlife Troopers, and State Department of Fish and Game are investigating the attack. Yeah, I mean, it's like we... Um, we talked about last week with the bison. For some reason, people don't think that cattle or bovine creatures or muskox in this case or bison are, um, are are dangerous animals. I think because we see cows so frequently as these like domesticated cows, that you know you can tip them over, you can go cow tipping. They're not they're not a threat. But um, the wild variety of these bovine creatures, obviously, that is not the case. And I think people forget that um, that that could have been the case here. Very sad. Let's move on. Uh, we will talk about our next article, uh, which is from that last one was Fox, from Fox News. I don't know if it, this is from News Four Jax J A X. I guess it's a Jacksonville uh, news uh, news group. Okay, yep. Jacksonville zookeeper viciously attacked by bear, suffered laceration on head, back, thighs. Police report. This is a uh, this sounds like a classic man eater story. Okay, um, this is from Jacksonville. Florida? F-A- F-L-A. I think Jacksonville's in Florida, but I could be wrong. The 35-year-old zookeeper who was viciously attacked Wednesday by a 5-year-old North American black bear at the Jacksonville Zoo and Garden suffered many lacerations on her head, back, and thighs, according to a police report obtained Thursday by News 4 Jax. The incident report from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office states that the door to the bear enclosure was open when the bear attack occurred. The bear came out of the open gate and went directly to the zookeeper, who was then attacked, the report said. According to Kelly Rulliard, uh, director of marketing for the zoo, the bear, named Johnny, escaped an exhibit behind the scenes just after 5 p.m. Wednesday and engaged with the zookeeper behind the scenes who called out for help. The help call was heard by another team member who was close by who made the emergency call to in, uh, initiate the weapons team. A witness told police that she and her co-workers began throwing items at the bear to get him away from the zookeeper. The zoo's lethal weapons team was notified by radio. A member of the lethal weapons team said that he saw the animal actively attacking the zookeeper when he arrived. He told police that he was waiting for the veterinarian team to get a tranquilizer gun ready, but feared for the zookeeper's life, saying the bear continued to viciously attack when he fired four rounds from a 12-gauge shotgun into the bear's head, chest, and back. He reported that the bear retreated into the back of the enclosure where it collapsed and died. Our animal care team has cared for these animals for years, so this is something that is very disheartening for us to have to face a situation like this, said Rulliard. The report notes that the bear did not have its canine teeth, the long ones that can do the most damage. Rulliard said Johnny had been at the zoo since May of 2017. According to the report, the zookeeper was transported to a UF Health Jacksonville hospital downtown with injuries that were not life-threatening at the time. She is expected to survive, but there was no update on Friday on how she's going. A statement from the zoo reads, At 5.10 p.m. tonight, one of our North American black bears escaped the exhibit and engaged with the zookeeper behind the scenes. An emergency radio call was initiated and our lethal weapons team responded immediately. Our highest priority is always the safety of human lives. Therefore, the bear was shot and killed. We will be conducting an ongoing investigation over the coming days and weeks. We do not take this lightly. It is profoundly painful when we have a loss of an animal, especially under circumstances such as this. The zoo was open under its normal hours on Thursday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. with zoo lights from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., but the exhibit for Johnny is now empty. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's Captive Wildlife Office and Occupational Safety and Health Administration are investigating the incident. So yeah, that's the, obviously that's super sad. The article goes on. It seems there are more um, more injuries that have occurred at this zoo, including a man who jumped over a gate at a jaguar exhibition who was clawed by a jaguar, and there was a zookeeper who was injured when she was struck by a rhinoceros. Um, let's read a little bit about those. 
Before Wednesday's incident, the Jacksonville Zoo had gone nearly 18 months before our last human-animal an encounter. Can you just imagine one of those little, like, you know, days since our last workplace incident thing, having to flick back over to zero because of Johnny? In July 2021, a man who jumped over a gate of the range of the jaguar exhibit at the zoo was clawed by a jaguar after sticking his hand into the pen. The man, said to be in his 20s, was hospitalized for non-life-threatening injuries. In February 2019, a zookeeper was injured when she was struck by the horn of a rhinoceros during a routine training session. She was taken to hospital for evaluation. The FWC, which is jurisdiction over wildlife facilities in the state, found Robbie was separate, uh, separated from the rhino by a horizontal bar but fell forward when something spooked the 50-year-old rhino named Archie. She was initially struck and then struck again when she was in the pen with a 4,000-pound animal. In 2018, there were two incidents. A lion entered an exhibit that was being cleaned by a staff member who didn't know the lion was there. The staff member escaped injury by jumping into a moat. The other incident, an elephant broke free of its enclosure for a short period of time and was guided back inside. I don't want to malign this zoo, but they are seeming to have quite a few uh, incidents. and They might need to step up their game a little bit. Obviously, that's quite a sad story. It's great that the, um, that the person is going to survive hopefully and if we do uh hear more about that story for next week we'll do a follow-up up and i'll let you know how she's going um that's obviously great that she's going to survive it is sad that they had to kill johnny but it is also understandable the uh preservation of human life always comes first but it's like it, it's said in that article and it's like what happened with harambe right like these the people raise these animals from when they're basically babies you know if you have a pet that you've raised since you were a baby can you imagine having to kill it with your own bare hands if it's sort of attacking your brother or sister or parents or something like that, it's just, it's just brutal. It's very sad. Um, and I think the people who make jokes about this, I mean, you can make jokes, that's fine, but you just acknowledge you're being an asshole. It's like the people who made fun of the, you know, the whole dicks out for Harambe thing, even when the zoo specifically said like, Hey, please don't do this anymore. Cause it actually is very sad for us. And it's making us cry and people just kept doing it. I mean, it is the internet that's kind of to be expected, but you know, I mean, you're a bit of a dick for doing it anyway. Guys, that is it for our uh, Scratch of the Day segment. Three great stories there. Uh, really interesting stuff. As always, I'll link those three into the uh, caption of this episode if you want to listen to them or read those stories yourself. Let's move on now to our Beastly Biography. So, the Beastly Biography, guys, part of the show where we highlight a potential man-eating animal. We talk a little bit about this, the science behind these animals. We just give you a brief overview. Usually it's an animal that we haven't had time to talk about much in uh, in the man-eaters stories. And today we're talking about the Komodo dragon. So the Komodo dragon is the largest extant species of lizard, growing to a maximum length of three meters and weighing up approximately 70 kilograms. As a result of their size, Komodo dragons are apex predators, and they dominate the ecosystems in which they live. Komodo dragons hunt and ambush prey, including invertebrates, birds, and mammals. It has been claimed that they have a venomous bite. There are two glands in the lower jaw that secrete several toxic proteins. The biological significance of these proteins is, however, disputed, but the glands have been shown to secrete an anticoagulant. Komodo dragons' group behavior in hunting is exceptional in the reptile world. The diet of Komodo dragons mainly consists of a Javan rusa, or rusa timorinus, although they do eat considerable amounts of carrion. Komodo dragons also occasionally attack humans. Mating season begins between May and ends in August, and the eggs are laid in September. As many as 20 eggs are deposited at a time in an abandoned megapode nest or in a self-dug nest, uh, nesting hole. The eggs are incubated for seven to eight months, hatching in April when insects are most plentiful. Young Komodo dragons are vulnerable and dwell in trees to avoid predators such as cannibalistic adults. They take up to eight to nine years to mature and are estimated to live to up to 30 years. Komodo dragons were first recorded by Western scientists in 1910. Their large size and fearsome reputation makes them popular zoo exhibits. In the wild, their range is, con is contracted due to human activities and is likely to contract further from the effects of climate change. Due to this, they are listed as endangered on the IUCN Red List. They are protected under the Indonesian law and Komodo National Park was founded in 1980 to aid protection efforts. The Komodo dragon, here's some stats. Their population size, 3,000 
four, uh, 3,014 members of that population. Their lifespan, up to 30 years of age. The top speed on land is 20 kilometers per hour. They can weigh between 68 to 91 kilograms. In length, they are up to 2.5 meters long. Their location, they are only located in Indonesia. The diet. Komodo dragons are carnivorous. Although they have been considered as eating mostly carrion, they will frequently ambush live prey. Their diet is wide-ranging and includes invertebrates and other reptiles, including smaller Komodo dragons, birds, bird eggs, small mammals, monkeys, wild boar, goats, deer, horses, and water buffalo. Young Komodos will eat insects, eggs, geckos, and small mammals, while adults prefer to hunt large mammals. Occasionally, they attack and bite humans. As such, I've listed their man-eater status as moderate. We don't have any incidents of them eating human bodies however since they feast on carrion it is not above the realm of possibility they are quite aggressive and they can cause considerable danger thus they are a moderate man eater here's some fun facts about the komodo dragon the komodo dragon is known as the komodo monitor or the komodo island monitor in the scientific literature to the natives of komodo island it is referred to as aura biora darat which means land crocodile, or Biwak Raksasa, giant monitor. Komodo dragons can see objects as far away as 300 meters and can distinguish colors. Komodo dragons use their tongues to detect, taste, and smell stimuli with the vormeral ver- nasal sense using, Jacobson or- J- using the Jacobson's organ rather than using their nostrils. With the help of a favorable wind and their habitat of swinging and their habit of swinging their head from side to side as they walk, Komodos can 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 detect carrion from up to four to nine point five kilometers away. That's up to five point nine miles away for the Americans. Some of the scales on the skin of Komodos are reinforced with bone and have sensory plaques connected to nerves to facilitate their sense of touch. The scales around their ears, lips, chin, and soles of the feet may have three or more sensory plaques. The eating habits of Komodo dragons follow a hierarchy with the larger animals generally eating before the smaller ones. Dragons of equal size may resort to wrestling. Losers usually retreat, though they have been known to be killed and eaten by the victors. The Komodo dragon drinks by sucking water into its mouth via buckle pumping, a process also used for respiration. The animal lifts its head and lets the water run down its throat. Komodo dragons prefer to avoid encounters with humans. Juveniles are very shy and will flee quickly into a hideout if a human comes closer than about 100 meters. Older animals will also retreat from humans from a shorter distance away. If cornered, however, they will react aggressively by gaping their mouth, hissing, and swinging their tail. If they are disturbed further, they may start an attack and bite, and these bites can be deadly. So that's the Komodo dragon. Uh... There haven't been many documented cases of people being attacked or eaten by them, but if there ever is, you better believe we will talk about them on a full episode of Man Eaters. We're moving on to the last segment of the day, which is our Man Eater trivia. Okay, so last week, I asked you the following question. The question was, which word means eating of human flesh? And the options were, A, anthropomorphism. B, anthropophagus. C, anthropophilic. Or D, anthropophobia i i'm trying to pronounce this the best i can so i put that question up to you guys i also threw it up on the instagram for you to answer um most of you got it correct the answer is b anthropophagus anthropomorphism is is the giving of human traits i believe to animals and the other uh, anthropophobia is like a fear of animals i think um and anthropophilic i think means sexual something so you know um but yeah anthropophagus is the word uh anthropophagus i think that's how you pronounce it that is the word that means eating of human flesh if you guess that correctly well done Uh, as always you know go on the instagram and and vote like you can do for the next question which is going to go up in about a day the next question this week's question Okay, so there is a book called The Naked Ape, written by Desmond Morris. And in this book, well, I'll read you the whole question. I'm not going to paraphrase. According to Desmond Morris, the author of The Naked Ape, and many other books about human biology, there are only three species that regularly prey on humans. Which of the following does he not mention? The options are A, wolves, B, crocodiles, C, tigers, D, sharks. So I'll read that again to you. According to Desmond Morris, the author of The Naked Ape and many other books about human biology, there are only three species that regularly prey on humans. Which of the following does he not mention? 
A, wolves, B, crocodiles, C, tigers, D, sharks. Now, I got this wrong, actually. This was not the answer I was expecting, and it surprised me. We'll talk about that next episode. If you want to vote on your on what you think the answer is, go on to our Instagram. We'll do a... Uh, a poll as the as the as story I guess and you can vote there but yeah I think about like most people got the got it right last week a few people got got it very wrong um but you know it's a learning experience hopefully you've learned something okay so yeah follow us on Instagram go uh and look at our story and in about a day uh, after I release this episode we will post that question you can vote on it um and I will uh, let you know what the answer is next week guys that'll do it thank you so much for listening to Man Eaters thank you for supporting the show as always you can send any questions you have uh any any suggestions any feedback to our email which is always there on all, all the social media please contact reach reach out I love it I love Love talking to people it's great um we also have a patreon thank you so much to the people on patreon who have supported me so far thanks to you i've been able to not only uh make a new little podcast note but also bought a little microphone and uh hopefully we'll be making that sound real nice for you soon uh so yeah thank you so much if you do want to join the patreon go to www.patreon uh, man it is slash patreon patreon slash man it is i'm not sure what it is you'll easily find it for as little as five dollars a week uh, a month sorry five dollars a month you can uh, support the show it'll be fantastic it'll be a great time and you'll get a warm fuzzy feeling uh and i love you even more than i already do that is today's episode thank you so so much for joining me i will see you guys next week with an episode of man in movies and everyone please please do me a favor stay safe out there because as we've learned it's a jungle out there